The theme for today's uh, presentation, I mean, I, I like to keep it quite informal uh, uh, in the sense that it's, it's about connect, which means making connections. And we often, uh, and, and the, the film that we saw was, was, a, was I think, it a really good, uh, uh, what, it, what it did well was capture the, the essence of the city. And uh, what I'm going to show you today is not something very technical that, you know, as uh, irrespective of my training as an urban planner, as an architect, but it's understanding your city where you live in and what what we take for granted today has, has been in evolution for the past two, three hundred years. And we often understand historicity as something that is static. And what I will try and do is break that bubble and say it is it is something that is always in motion. It is something that is evolving with each one of us. How many of you have been to the Tipu Sultan's uh, palace in... Uh, I know Karishma has because she's worked on it, so she's not allowed to answer that. But uh, how many of you have actually seen the palace? It is right behind the Kote Venkatramana temple, uh, right next to... Uh, right behind the Fort High School in Chamrajpet. So, what it does, it, it, it gives you a sense of what the palace was, uh, what its location was. The location today might be kind of inconspicuous. You don't even know that the palace exists. But what you will see is that the evolution of where the palace was. And I think these images will, will give you a good sense of understanding what the city is. And how do you start to make these connections to what the city is today, to what it was 15 20, 100, 200 years ago. Uh, some images of, of the bandstand in, in, uh, in, in Lal Bagh. This was actually inside the historic uh, fort of, uh, of the city. It's in Lal Bagh. And, and uh, images of, of Lal Bagh again. I'll quickly go through glass house. And strange, these two pine trees are still there. If you go to Lal Bagh today and stand at that location, at the steps, you will see the pine trees, even today. So, it, they've probably seen more of the city than we have, right? Lal Bagh, this structure is still there. It's, it's kind of covered now, but you'll see it. Some of the other uh, images of uh, Nandidurg Road, uh, some of the historic monuments coming out of there. These are all the sketches from 1792. And I'll take you through the, the history of the city. Uh, this is St. Mark's Church and the bandstand. Um, this is the residency, which is now the governor's building, governor's uh, Raj Bhavan. Right? So, again, the residency images. How many of you have seen this building? Do you know where this is? This is uh, right next to the Vishweshwaraya Technical uh, Museum. This was actually Lal Bagh in 17, late 1700s, right? What you see today as Lal Bagh is something very different. So this probably was taken on top of the, the, the Lal Bagh uh, kind of rocky outcrop where you have the Kempegoda Tower. And uh, you will see Lal Bagh, that's the fort, uh, what you see as M, uh, the fort, and then you have the Pete of the city. Uh, this is actually uh, inside the palace uh, of how the palace looked when it was built. It was built in, it was completed in 1792, 1791, 1792 and then that was when the, the war happened. Some images of, of graduation uh, parties probably early uh, of all this. And this is actually one of the earliest images of the fort of Bangalore, of uh, what it looked like. Uh, now again, we as Indians, we've never had the habit of documenting what exists. Everything is verbal, right? Recipes from, you know, when I went and studied in the Netherlands, I didn't know to cook to save my life. So I actually emailed my mother. She sent me the recipe 
and she would not know how to put it on paper because it was all verbal. She would tell you, oh, you need this much of turmeric, this much of all of these combinations and then you can do, but it is not that simple. Right? So, what, what uh, it, it just goes to show that we are predominantly, you know, our traditional knowledge transfer happens verbally, it is not documented and it, it is also in the way we document cities and what we, what I will show you today is trying to understand that again, some of the other images of, uh, of Bangalore. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the U.S. club, the Bangalore fort. Uh, this is uh, from the south gate of Bangalore, uh, from the Bangalore fort. I will show you some of the imagery again in the actual presentation, but I'll quickly take you through this. Uh, looking at Savandurga Mountains, uh, this is actually the fort of Bangalore just after uh, the Third Mysore War. Now, understanding the city in the context of what was Bangalore's role in the four Mysore wars, right? The wars that happened between the British and the and the Tipu Sultan, and uh, uh, in and finally culminated in Sri Patna. But what was Bangalore's role? It played a critical role in the way uh, British were able to establish a permanent military base for the first time in India in Bangalore. So that's where the cantonment really starts to take shape. So you understand that historical events have actually shaped the city. In, in the way the city has evolved. And uh, some of the images, again, this is Someshwara temple in Alsur. Uh, this is, uh, I'll show you a more detailed map of, so that's the fort and the pete of, of the city from 1791. Uh, this is uh, Hesargatta, the water system. Again, looking at Lalbagh from top of the hill. Lalbagh again, and this is the first image of uh, uh, this is quite ironical, Lord Cornwallis, who, who has been credited with establishing the British Empire here, actually lost the war of independence in the United States and he was sent to India as a punishment and he became the most successful Governor General of India. That when he lost to the Patriots in 1666 uh, in the US, he was sent here. Uh, as part of a political kind of asylum from and then he came and in, invaded uh, uh, Sri Rangpatna and what you see is actually a, a rendering of where the British army camped before invading the fort and that area is the cantonment. So you can see some of the images, I don't know if, if, if the image is clear enough, you, at the far horizon you will start seeing the pete which also starts to show that you understand the city in its contours, which were the high points in the city because these were all military and strategic planning of how, how these colonial armies were looking at. Again, another better rendering of the city. These were all the fort gates of, uh, of, the, of the Bangalore fort. Uh, this is the Victoria Hospital, Bangalore Palace. Again, the entry to the palace. Uh, this is again the 1791 image of the fort, uh, Alsur Lake. And anyway, I think uh, this is this is the first image of KR Road. Right? This is the road that is in between uh, Fort High School and the KR Market. That was the road inside the palace. The stretch of KR Road currently, which is called KR Road. It was the main road between inside the fort. So this is the first image of that road. So we are also trying to understand what is the character of the street. Um, again, images. This is the entry and you will see the... Uh, uh, so we did a very detailed study and a couple of people who were a part of that study are here in the audience. But uh, some of the imagery, in fact, I don't know how many of you know what we call as Hudson Circle today. Uh, there was a uh, there was a cenotaph uh, dedicated in the memory of the the British soldiers who died during the war of uh, 1791, which was the first time when Bangalore was taken over by the British, given back to Tipu as part of the settlement. But again, his kingdom was completely divided into three, four, five different segments: the Nizams, the Marathas, and the British army basically divided the kingdom into different pieces. Um, this is bang inside the Bangalore Palace. This is this was as as uh, uh, this is about close to early 1800s, and you can see you can see the fort wall uh, a little bit of uh, 
uh, the more you you start to see the first pieces of the the pete and how the pete really was was in existence and uh, again entry of the palace this is how the palace was uh, in 1791 uh, how many of you have been to the gavi ganga deshwara temple in hanuman nagar this was the first image of of the temple so these temples and and some of these cultural anchors and, and, and what is important today as part of this this whole theme of connect is to understand what these anchors have played a role in shaping the uh, the character of the city so i'll again this is another image of the fort and probably this is a, a mission school graduation party so uh, we can look at nandi hills fort of banana now all these gates were designed for elephants to go through so that was exactly the width of the gate and you wonder why were the gates so wide because the elephant had to go through it uh, you can see lal bagh here again you see the pete on the right and you start to see that what you see there is actually the fort the fort was actually on a small hillock at some point which was also strategic because you had line of sight you could see everything that's coming from down below and uh, images of the palace what you see as the 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 pillar there which is the uh, uh, the garuda stamba right which is of the kote venkatramana temple what we found out during our research when we did the study was what you see today is really not the original garuda stamba that has existed with the temple the temple predates the establishing of bangalore it's much older uh, and we found that during the war the the, the garuda stamba was uh, damaged a portion of it was chipped off and we later realized that when they widened kr road the original garuda stamba was in the middle of the road so they conveniently just chopped it into three pieces and they dumped it in 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 uh, a small kind of mata of uh, mata is a cultural institution uh, in chamrajpet so we actually went treasure hunting and we found out where that mata was and we actually went and uh, captured uh, the images of those because you will never find them lying around in pieces that way so what we really found out was uh historical evidences and footprints have really changed as a result of decisions that people have made um these were the first images of uh, begur which where we get the name the first name of bangalore comes in from there from the first inscriptions in begur which is on the way to banagata the begur temple again this is the first promenade which is currently kr road looking towards uh and what you see here is the entry gate from uh, which is the end of avenue road if you go on uh, here, the uh, mysore bank circle road on majestic the main road of majestic uh, avenue road comes and joins majestic there this is a signal right there that is this entrance which was the rear entrance of the pete which was breached by the british and then eventually became the the stronghold of the british over time uh again images of ramgiri which is ramnagra uh, images of uh, chennapatna so uh, gives you a good sense of what these images are so i'll quickly take you through the presentation now which will uh, i think hopefully given you guys a a good sense of what the what the city is so what i'm trying to trying to understand is uh in the evolution of the city we we play a role and we play a role in terms of uh, uh understanding what has evolved why it has evolved and what has triggered the evolution uh, evolution of the city so uh, and i broadly put it in five categories right there is a cultural aspect to the city the kalakai parshes the festivals um the someshwara rath yatra that happens in alsur uh, there is the social aspect the people right the communities who live there there is the physical aspect which is the physical character of the city right and then there is the economic aspect of the city which is not the it it is, is the current economic generator but if you still see bangalore's economy is only what 40% it 60% is still the other traditional functions that have 
remained in Bangalore, the service industry, right? Why did, uh, has anybody even wondered why did the Darshanis sta start off only in Bangalore? They have never existed anywhere else. It is also, and then, I mean, our understanding is that Bangalore has always been a city in transition. So, people come, go and they move on and it is also the case even today. People from in the IT industries and other industries come to Bangalore, but pr most of them do not consider this their home. They are here to work, they will earn a living and they finally, eventually they either reside here and decide to become residents of Bangalore or they go back home. But what it has done, it has shaped the, the city's character in terms of understanding uh, the, the come and go, I do not need to sit down, I just need to eat and move on. So, that whole darshani style has predominantly also shaped the way the eatery industry uh, is and I mean the food street in Vishweshpuram is a great example. You go there uh, uh, on a weekday and you start to see that the entire street just transforms itself during the day it is all shut and you wonder what kind of street is this because it is open in the night. It is open till 12, 1 o'clock at night and I remember as, a, as an architectural student we would all work late in the night. And we would take a break at 11 o'clock at night and then go have some what they call masala pepsis, your Pepsi with uh, Pani Puri, Jaljeera masalas. This were classic hits and it would all bring all the college communities together in, in, in food street. So, it tries to understand how the street, in a way, what the street does, it facilitates the function. So, what you will see today is how the built environment, which is buildings, public spaces, actually facilitates the cultural character of the city, the communities that use that, uh, uh, who are connected with those cultural functions, traditions and the economic aspect as a, as a result coming out of that. And so therefore, it, it is, a, so the built form in some ways is at the intersection of the community, the economy and the function in which. So, what, what I will try and do is, is take you through the historical past of Bangalore and, and understand uh, the historicity. So, this was the first uh, documented evidence of, of what Bangalore was when it was established in 15, early 1500s, 1537 by Kempegoda the first. Uh, what you see is, I do not know if, can you see some of these blue patches there? All those were the lake systems within which Bangalore was established. The, there were four large lakes, Belandur, Alsur. Uh, uh, so, you have all the different lake systems which uh, and Bangalore is on a plateau, right? So, about 3000 feet above sea level. So, these are a system of lakes that overflowed one to another. So, if one lake would fill up, it would overflow to the next, to the next, to the next. Eventually, they would end up in the four bigger lakes. So, we were established in a system of lakes, right, to understand uh, the system of lakes. So, uh, so what you see is the Pete was established first, then you start to see that the fort came in, uh, in uh, early six, uh, late 1600, 1690 to be precise, but the fort was a mud fort, then eventually was converted to a stone fort by Hyder Ali during his reign in Sri Patna. And what you see here, this is the first documented map of the city of Bangalore uh, or the Pete. So, that is the Pete and the fort and what you see here and I do not know how many of you can see these, can you see these lines coming from there? Those were, so this is actually a military map drawn by the British during the third uh, war, Mysore war that was fought in Bangalore to begin with and then eventually culminated in in uh, Sri Patna. So, what you see there and that is a blow up there, you can see these images here. What you see that is where the fort was breached and that breach is exactly the width of KR road today. So, where KR road passes by the fort on your left is where the breach happened. So, where the fort was breached and the British army was able to come in closer. There was another reason for why that particular portion was invaded because what you see here is where there is a dungeon inside the fort where a British officer was kept captive by the Tipu's army. So, they breached the fort closest to the dungeon to take uh, the captive out or the prisoner out 
and ironically uh, that prisoner was the one who killed Tipu in the fourth Mysore war. David Baird uh, is the is the name of the the British officer who was killed, uh, who killed Tipu. Uh, so what you see here is I'm trying to take you through the evolution of the city from 1870 through 1924. You start to see what the city was. So if you if you go back to the previous slide, you will see that was the fort, right? It had it had four. Uh, it had basically two gates. Uh, the the entry to the north is called the Delhi Gate because it is oriented towards Delhi. What you see here in the south is called the Mysore Gate because it oriented towards Mysore. But you don't see Mysore Gate today because Mysore Gate is where City Institute sits currently. The gate's gone, but there are re there are remains of the gate. In term, not in terms of physical remains, the name still the, is there. If you go see the city institute wall, right, it says old south gate road. The road name is there, the gate is not there. So, what, what it also helps you understand is these are all remnants in either in terms of a name or actual physical evidence of, of the gate remaining. So, you will see uh, again 1924. You, you start to see some of the fort wall is actually starting to being dismantled and then we started to understand why was the fort dismantled and you start to realize the certain main roads started to come in what you call as AV road which currently is Allur Venkat Ramna road but it initially it was called Albert Victor road it just kept the name the initials the same right so you will start to see and then if you actually map the the historic city in the current context of where Bangalore is, you will start to realize that there is a very distinct character of the city right in the middle, and that's the Pete. So you will see. So this this point there is where the fort the Pete was breached. The current layout of the fort in the context of where the city is today. And what I will take you through is understanding different components of the fort, right? So there was a Delhi Gate complex, the one at the top, Mysore Gate complex. You had the parade ground, which is number three, which is your Bangalore Medical College today. There is no parade ground, but if you see the footprint, the size of Bangalore Medical College, it is the exact size of the parade ground today. There, and you will see the palace. That's number four. You will start to see that. What you understand as a city today is actually a footprint of what existed before. And uh, there were two gates, uh, there were two kind of layers of walls. Uh, and then you have the Cavalier Grand Magazine. How many of you have seen the Grand Magazine behind Bangalore Medical College? It's a, it's a small structure that is fairly underground behind BMC. Not many know of this. But it, it was, it was one of the key uh, key pieces uh, of where the Tipu stored the gun powder. They had to keep it below ground because it was cooler. Uh, otherwise, this thing would hold blow up, right? Because of the heat. And also understanding the evolution. And then we realize that today there is a concentration of hospitals in the in the area. There is Vani Villa, there is Victoria Hospital, there is BMC. Then you have at the Minto Eye Hospital and then we realized why why is there such a concentration of hospitals. Then during our archival research we also found out that there was a plague in, in 1898 in Bangalore. There is a plague ep epidemic and uh, as a result of that a, a big chunk of this uh, of the fort, uh, the area inside the fort was demolished to put hospitals. And that basically was a area that the British could control better. And then they established the uh, neighborhoods of Maleshwaram and Basunguri, one to the north and one to the south as quarantine areas, where the people with plague were kept fairly segregated from the rest of the population. And if you see the character of Maleshwaram and Basunguri, they are fairly similar. They are well laid out grids. You have 8th, 9th, 10th, all the way up to 18th cross. And in Basunguri, you have all the different but what you see is is unique is, a, is there is a second layer of conservancy lanes. Conservancy lanes were basically smaller lanes to the uh, that were connected to the back of the houses where all the toilets were located. So all the human excreta could be taken out without coming through to the front of the door. 
there is also a sense of bringing in hygiene into traditional houses in, in, uh, in Bangalore. So, uh, so these are all the different uh, hospitals, the maternity hospital, the dispensaries uh, and then we also map all the cultural institutions like the SLN institute, there is a community of, uh, of oil pressers who still live there and what the community represents uh, and then understanding all the administrative institutions, uh, 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 the health health office inside the palace, the police stations, understanding some of the cultural anchors of the temples, the, uh, the churches and why the temples have existed there. If you see, if you go past uh, the fort on KR road, you will see a small uh, Anjaneya Swami temple on the right. Right? I do not know how many of you have been there, it is called Kote Anjaneya. There is Kote Venkatramana inside the temple, there is Kote Anjaneya outside. At one point, the Anjaneya temple was just outside the fort. So, people basically would visit the Anjaneya temple before entering because Anjaneya symbolizes Chiranjivi, which is long life, safety. So, it is also understanding where the temple sits currently in the evolution of the city. Again, so what is what you what you start to see here is if I map from 1791, which is the first historical uh, mapping of the city to 1998, you will see there is absolutely no resemblance to uh, the, the way the, the settlement was inside except this particular quadrant. If you see, the, the character has remained the same in terms of network of streets, type of buildings and then we realized that this is where uh, the community of, uh, of uh, milk vendors currently live. They have lived there for the past 200 years and they continue to live there. Uh, they are called the Golas. So, the Gola community continue to live in, in that precinct, you know, this precinct. So, basically this is your Albert Victor Road, this is Kia Road and, and I will show you another imagery of, uh, of the road network. So, Remember the image I showed you of the uh, of the road inside the fort that was this segment, right? But if you see, if the fort was breached here, you will start to see that Kia Road begins to take shape, going right through the breach. That's the only place they had to put a road. Once the fort was breached, so you start to see what you see today as Kia Road. Some of the bends have been straightened out, right? This bend is not there. It just they just went through straight, but you start to see a small bend which is which is where you have a lot of traffic jams today with all the buses coming and joining of the Kalash Palyam bus stand. And you start to see that there is a, there, there's, there's only a remnant of the fort that is on your left hand side. So, uh, so, what we did is we took the footprint of the fort and we overlaid that with, so we gave it some color coding so that we understand that this was the moat, this was the uh, uh, the fort wall that existed at some point in the city's evolution and uh, then we understood that these are the four quadrants, right. I talked about quadrant 1, 2, 3, 4, quadrant 2 is really the one that has retained its character and then we also understood. So, if you saw the first imagery I showed you of the five aspects of the city, cultural, social, physical, institutional. We also started to map this in the historical part of Bangalore. You start to understand what are all the, so this is where the Golya community currently lives. There is the commercial development at number 3 and 4 is also uh, uh, partly planned development of, of quadrant number 3. And then quadrant 1 is completely void of all the historical buildings because all the hospitals came in at some point. And, uh, Again, so this is the, the network of quadrant uh, 2 and you start to see that some of the, so if you overlay the red network over the, the network of the blue which is basically your road network, you start to see that at some point these networks begin to match and then we also said that if, if, if we superimpose what you see in red is actually the, uh, the fort wall and the moat. And what you see today as Kalas Palyam bus stand and what you see today as Silver Jubilee Park Road is the width of the moat. 
so the there was no other space to expand so when you go next time when you go through silver jubilee park road try to imagine that this was you are actually driving in a moat because that was the exact width because on one side you will see the pete on the other side you will see the fort hopefully but not today because today everything has changed over time and then again we started to map the gola community and what is what is really interesting is the gola community has has developed a, a system they are milk vendors so right so they produce milk they have cows and you will see all the cows go out in the morning they come back in the evening and they so the cows or the or the cow shed is actually on the ground floor so you will start to see the cows there right so their their buildings in some ways are facilitating the function of milk vending so the the cows are on the ground floor they live on the first floor the family and on the second floor is where they do all the milk products your um, uh, dooth pedas your paneer everything connected to milk vending is all happening in the same building now what we are saying as part of now as this is where i start to wear my urban planning hat where i'm saying that when you devise building regulations a regulation that applies in core mangla where it does not have the same character cannot apply in the golla community it should not apply but currently that's the way the cities building regulations are designed they are not context specific they are not specific to the golla community they are a predominant economic engine in the historical area of bangalore and one has to understand that we have to keep these connections some of the economic mapping we've done of all the economic activities that happen you know there is uh, and especially this is not just the the fort area in the pete there is a small portion within the pete which is known as tara mandal pete the tara mandal pete is where tipu sultan test fired his rockets they were looking like shooting stars right so the area was called tara mandal pete you have bini pete nagrat pete mamul pete uh, bale pete uh, so you have and then you have a very small portion which is uh, probably in the north north uh, or uh, yeah northeast northwest portion of of the pete and then we went there today the so they would manufacture rockets there right so that is where the rocket production used to happen for for the tipu's army the manufacturing quality is still there or character is still there they manufacture machine tools now they don't manufacture rockets anymore but the character of manufacturing is still there intact it is an economic activity that is happening in the pete so how do you understand so when you go see something in the pete it's also important to try and visualize where do i make these connections to because this is not something that has come up overnight this have been remain this have been in in process for the last 15 20 or 100 years so understanding the current gaps of the master plan i've already talked about it now i will show you we used a similar principle in the city of nayar raipur now nayar raipur uh, is this, is uh, is in the state of chatisgarh chatisgarh was formed was state was basically carved out of madhya pradesh in 2000 so new state uh, its current capital is raipur a small town not very big but it is a big uh, economic engine for the state because it has a lot of mineral deposits so there the state is very very rich in in uh, uh, in ore so what you see here and that's that's uh, that's uh, uh, raipur if you see it in in the state of chatisgarh and uh, 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 so what now this is this is also an exercise that that we are currently undertaking with the state of chatisgarh in terms of designing their city keeping in context of what currently exists on the ground so what you see in bangalore the same principle has been used so what uh, what happened was in again in the year 2000 the state was formed and in 2002 uh, the master plan of bank or of nara the master plan is basically a document that lays out where do you want the open spaces where do you want your main corridor what you see in yellow is where all the residential housing will come so basically it is a distribution of land use land uses where certain types of activities can happen in a city it's a planning mechanism an urban planning mechanism that helps you understand what the city should be just to give you a sense of context this is the city of raipur 
Narayapur is about 25 kilometers away from the existing city. It is a brand new city, 6000 hectares, which is about half the size of Bangalore. It is a pretty big city that is being built brand new out of nothing that exists. There is this agricultural fields where the new city is being planned. What was important is uh, given its historical nature, Narayapur is also, and Raipur and Narayapur, which is the new capital has a wonderful system of lakes again. But what the, the city was doing was they were flattening everything and they are building as if we were building on, on a flat piece of land, right. And then they went and put roads that were 100 meters wide. Can you imagine, You I think you need to be Usain Bolt to really cross the road from one end to the other with vehicles traveling at 80, 90 kilometers an hour. What it does, if you see character of, uh, of uh, historical neighborhoods, these neighborhoods are walkable and you can walk in them and it is really difficult to drive because everybody is on the street, all the activities that are happening on the street. But can you imagine doing that in a place like Nairapur where you have these roads that are 100 meters wide. We talk about 100 feet road in Indranagar, this is 100 meters road, right, 100 meters is 300 feet, right. So, the, the whole human scale is missing in this. If you were walking in, in Narayapur, you would really not feel like walking there because there is nothing, not, not, not because of the lack of development, but because the road is so wide, the whole perception of walking is, is not there. So, what we did is what, what we did is try and capture the city's character in terms of economic activities, green spaces, water bodies and our so called speed breakers, right. We have all the buffaloes walking there and it is still there in Narapu. They continue to have this character. And then we said, well, let us first map the, so what you see today in, in that larger master plan that you see is we map the lake systems that existed in the city, similar to the way we did in Bangalore. And uh, we also said, if that is the current city of Raipur and that is the Naya Raipur, what what kind of character do we want to establish in the new city that exists in the new uh, in the existing city? Because people from Raipur will eventually live in Narayapur. It's about people, and we are the ones who carry our customs and traditions and lifestyle, eating habits, cultural anchors, temples, and all of these. So, what kind of character do you want to create in there? And so, what we did is we we tried and uh, with the city of Narayapur. We showed them that, and and if you if you see the a couple of slides behind, um, the city has been designed. The city of Raipur is fairly organic, like the Pete, right? But our contemporary approach is make everything like Manhattan, like make everything grid lines. It's easier for infrastructure. It's not easy for people. It's it's easy for to lay all your cables of electrical and sewer and plumbing, but not for people because people do not live in grid patterns, right. So, what you see is what Narayapur has done is they basically divided the city into sectors, so like 35 sectors and each sector is almost a kilometer wide in either direction. So, it is about a kilometer in depth and kilometer in width. So, what we and that is that is what the city had planned for one of their sector, fairly boring way in which they had flattened the entire sector and they said let us build something brand new. What we said is let us actually take maybe 10 steps back and understand what, so, so we picked up sector 31 to show how do you need to understand the connections that exist in the existing conditions and then build using those connections. So, we said the design process first starts so, that is roughly the size of the sector, it is about 800 meters in length, 750 meters in width and you have, so this is all your, uh, uh, your 100 meter roads on one side of the sector, the other sector is a slightly, uh, other road slightly smaller and then we overlaid the topography of the land and you, they realize that there is a wonderful system of, uh, of uh, the contours that really allow the sector to have its own character. And uh, then we overlaid uh, where the lakes 
currently exist. So we said if that is the topography of, of and we are also doing a similar initiative in Bangalore now. We have been approached by the government of Karnataka to restore the 400 lake systems in the regional Bangalore. Right, the first image that I showed you of Bangalore in the regional context, right, the, with just the Pete. There were about 400 lake, lake systems, about three or four major lakes. So now the government has realized, and again, the government is the biggest violator of its own regulation, right. And I tell this to them also, it is not just in a private audience. Why? Because all major government projects have been on lake beds, Kantirava Stadium, Kempe Goda bus stand, right, National Games Village, all of these were lakes at one point. So, what they did is first and Nairaipur was beginning to do that, and we said please do not re replicate Bangalore. The mistakes that we did are very difficult to correct now. But what they can do is not do those, not commit the same mistake. So, what what uh, Bangalore did was first of all they said the lakes exist in a network. So, they cut out the connections. Obviously, the lakes would dry up. Ah, there is land available. So, let us go put our infrastructure right in the middle of the city. You will never find land for the Kempegoda bus stand if the Dharmamudi lake never existed, right. So, understanding how the system of lakes. So, what we did in Narayapur was to show them that there are lakes that connect to another based on just the topography of land, how how water flows from a higher point to a lower point to a lower point to a lower point and eventually it collects at some place that here everything finally flows to the Mahanadi, the river which is about 60, 70 kilometers away from Raipur and then we and then we said there needs to be riparian areas which are basically buffer areas surrounding the lakes about 30 meters wide, 100 feet wide to understand that these are the areas that you need to protect. But it is not just now again the the, the classic uh, solution that, that uh, city agencies will come up to is oh let us go and restore the lake. So, they will do a late lake uh, beautification project, they will do all the paving but without understanding where will the water come from. If you provide physical barriers to surrounding the lake, water cannot seep in. So, understanding that these riparian areas and keeping the connection between the lakes are as important than the lake itself. So, this is where this 400 lake systems project is something that we are now beginning to push the government under the Congress leadership saying do it now, you can still do it. Understanding that restoring the Bangalore's lake system is as important as restoring the city's character. And then we said that these were all the lower points where the valleys based on the contours were and we realized that the sector 31 has a wonderful character and then we realized that historically there was a pedestrian route that went cutting right across the, the sector. And if you see the previous plan, they had not acknowledged that. Their planning was basically Manhattan super, superimposed in Narayapur and expecting it to function. So, what we said is why do not we keep that character in place. So, what we did was our road network that we are proposing uh, also keeps in uh, keeps in mind the contemporary mode in which people commute buses, two wheelers, cars. Uh, cycle rickshaws in Narayapur and also people who walk. So, we started to design the sector in such a way that it actually acknowledges the existing pedestrian routes, it acknowledges the water bodies, it acknowledges the densities in which people live because currently if you take Bangalore where population is 10 million, right, metropolitan Bangalore, city of Bangalore is about 7, 7.5 million people. But understanding that and we all live in very dense neighborhoods. If you go Malayshuram, go to Basangudi, Chamraj, Pet, Kormangla, but the densities are even higher if you go to places like uh, uh, the Pete. Uh, so, understanding that our urban living has a certain lifestyle, people want the certain, uh, uh, people expect a certain lifestyle to be living in a city. So, we created that lifestyle, but keeping in mind what exists on the ground and providing for them those lifestyles and 
and again we created the riparian zones and then what we did if we see Bangalore today in in its uh, uh, character there are these big open spaces there is parade ground there is Kaban Park and then there is Lal Bagh. But parade ground and Kaban Park were created as physical barriers between the white part of Bangalore and the local part of Bangalore which is Richmond town, Benson town, Cox town that is where the cantonment area of Bangalore was that is where the colonial army lived and then you have the native Bangalore. So, but eventually what has happened is the Lal Bagh, the Kaban parks and the parade ground has become the public space of the city that is where the city comes together at some point. So, we are basically what we did is we took the lake systems and we said you need to create open spaces where, where the community can come together outside not within your own buildings. So, we started to create that and then we created. So, what you see as, as these light green areas are where the water systems begin to connect one lake to another. So, we respected that and then we created a network of secondary open spaces. So, this is where now again with the advent of motorization of the cities, people do not do not walk enough in the city right. A, a great example if if how many of you are from Mumbai here? Anybody from Mumbai? All right. So, if, if you tell uh, where are you right. Suppose you call up your friend where are you? He said I am 20 minutes away. They will tell you how long it will take to get there. In Bangalore you say I am 5 kilometers away. It is a very clear understand uh, how people understand commuting in cities. In Mumbai distance does not matter. What matters is time right. You might be you might be if you are living in South Mumbai or you living in uh, in the suburbs like uh, uh, if you go to Kandivili, you will take you an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes. It, it might be 15, 20 kilometers, but it, distance is not a criteria for people from, Mom, from Bombay or Mumbai. But here it, it really is and you go to a place like Ahmedabad, they will say I am 6 kilometers away. So, there the sense of distance comes. Here in Bombay, it is perception of time, how long it takes to commute. So, what we are saying is we are also giving the perception of being able to walk within the neighborhoods without having to use your vehicle. So, if you want to go to the open space from any of these sectors that you live, you should be able to walk and your walking distance is the shortest distance and your driving distance is the longest distance. So, if you are able to walk, you should be able to get there in, in half the time than it will take you to drive which, which is an incentive for you to walk. But the perception of walking is greatly influenced by aspects of safety, security of women, children, senior citizens, everyone right. So, the, the, uh, the ability to walk is shaped by the environment in which you walk. So, you have to provide the environment for people to walk which is not just what Bangalore uh, uh, city corporation does it just provide payments and expect people to walk. They are forced to walk, but they may choose not to walk. So, it is the environment in which which is providing the street furniture, providing the adequate lighting, providing uh, you know garbage bins and so we, we are actually starting to bring in all these infrastructure components into it. Then we start to do the distribution of amenities, amenities are social infrastructure, hospitals, fire stations, police stations and then we bring in the actual plots. So, these are all the plotted developments where you will begin to see uh, these houses being uh, uh, designed. And then we, then we said if this is the predominant pedestrian uh, promenade uh, that, that has existed over a long period of time, we need to find a way to, to strengthen that. So, what we are doing is we, this is where you are putting all your high rise buildings because what it does, it brings the economic activity to the middle rather than push the economic activities to the outside. When you put an economic activity in the middle, it, it draws people from all the different corners to the middle of the sector. If you push it to the outside, the center of the sector really becomes isolated. It is also a notion of how economics work. And uh, so, what, what is really important is, uh, is understanding bottom up planning, which is uh, acknowledging the existing character and understanding that not everything 
uh, has to be built new. Sometimes just recognizing what exists is half the battle. The other half is only strengthening those or uh, making certain changes to it that really helps you evolve something that is better. So making way for the new but not forgetting the old. That's that's the last one again. All right. So uh, again, thank you for being very patient. I, this is something new, but uh, this this hopefully has helped at least put something in your in your in your thought process of understanding the city's character, understanding what has what has really shaped the city to be what it is today. Thank you again.